Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today is episode number 41 with Stephen Muller. Yeah, you know, prior to the financial collapse and, you know, my first day at Deutsche, I was thinking that way. I'm like, okay, I'm in finance. I'm on this ladder. I'm on this trajectory. I'm going to make director. I'm going to make managing director at some day in the future. It's just a matter of time. But then after the financial collapse, every everything just kind of got mixed up. And it was very difficult to make personal life decisions when you have that cloud over your head. And so over time, I started to, to kind of really question whether or not that was the right thing for me. And no joke, I did a Google search. A Google search at that time. <laughs> what's, what's the best place to work for? Which companies have the best culture? And Google came up, right? unsurprisingly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, very atypical, but I applied through that online portal where, you know, people call it the black hole and you never hear anything again. But I was fortunate enough, I, I got a call back and, um, you know, things worked out. The top two reasons to listen to today's show are, number one, tech. Stephen worked his way from the Navy to the world of finance and then managed to cross over to the world of tech at Google. He talks through how he made this impossible leap and advice for other veterans seeking to work at Google or tech startups in general. Number two, tactics. Stephen is a fellow submariner and he has a knack for breaking down the civilian world in military terms that are easy to understand. Today's episode is also available by video in addition to podcast. So if you go to beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find the video as well as show show notes, including timestamps for each topic we discuss and links to relevant websites. So let's dive into my interview with Stephen. So joining me today from Mountain View, California at Google's, one of Google's offices is Stephen Muller. Stephen, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. So for listeners, I wanted to give uh, an abbreviated background on you before we dive in. Uh, Stephen's over at Google. He works as their global strategic business development for uh, Google Play. He started out at the Naval Academy as part of the finest class to walk the streets of Annapolis, class of 2002, after which he served in the Navy for four years with the submarine force as part of the USS West Virginia After he transitioned out of the Navy, he worked for five years in the finance industry, first at Barclays Capital as their associate director, head of derivative client valuations for North America, and then at Deutsche Bank as a vice president. He then transitioned to Google, where he was a finance manager for four years before his current role. Uh, Stephen holds an MBA from the Duke Fuqua School of Business and a master's degree of engineering management from Old Dominion University. So, Stephen, maybe just to start things off, anything to add to that background or, or correct? Justin, you nailed it. <laughs> I'm right on the spot. Awesome. Um, well, let's, I, I want to kind of talk about how you ended up where you're at, but let, let's maybe just start with where you're at right now. How would you describe to another veteran what you do at Google? Yeah, so it's an interesting role. Uh, it's uh, I think the, fir- the thing that's really interesting is that veterans find the civilian workforce descript- job descriptions a bit daunting, but the reality is what I do is not a lot different than what a lot of junior officers do in various parts of the military. Uh, my job, I'm responsible for a team. Uh, some of the people on my team are managers. Some of the people on my team are specialists and, and more technically adept. Not different than being a, a, a division officer in a submarine, you know? Um, Half my time is spent uh, more of the day-to-day operations, driving improvements for our customers, which in my case are developers that uh, create apps for Android and Google Play. And the other half of my time is spent on more strategic thinking, trying to figure out more uh, efficient ways of doing things, driving down the per-customer investment. Well, um, what's, but- what's um, I always like... Um- one thing I always like to ask about is kind of what, what's the day to day look like? If you, you know, I, I imagine every day is different, but if you had like a typical day, what time are you getting in? What sort of activities are you doing? How many people you're working with? Just to give it a little bit more vivid description. What's really interesting and fascinating about this job is that no two days are really the same. Uh, that wasn't the case in banking. Banking was a little bit more uh, typical and structured, uh, more like eight to six. Uh, This job is definitely not a nine to five job, but if I had to sort of give you the lay of the land of what I do every day, uh, you know, the morning typically starts off with my kids waking me up about zero five (laughs) thirty. 
<laughs> with Reveille. Um, and then, uh, you know, I start promptly on emails. Yeah, because I'm part of a global team, uh, which is not surprising, and, and many of you should expect to be part of a global team. You know, we're getting emails overnight from our global counterparts that, you know, demand sort of a response first thing in the morning. Uh, working across time zones is something that people become very adept at doing. Uh, but then, you know, later in the morning, I'll, I'll typically, you know, host meetings around operations uh, related issues. Uh, early afternoon, I'll start, you know, setting up meetings with or attending meetings with some of my external facing customers. And then, you know, mid to late afternoon, I'm usually thinking about strategy type um, type issues and challenges for the next quarter. Uh, but again, no two days are really alike. You can't really predict what's going to come up, what sort of fire drill is going to happen, or uh, what what your what your boss needs from you in about two or three hours. But um, but generally speaking, that's kind of how my day goes. And and I always ask kind of the, the lifestyle component, especially around like work on weekends and travel. But I'm, I'm particularly interested. I, I know a lot of people admire Google, and they they kind of set the gold standard for the way in which they treat employees. So what's what's the lifestyle angle look like? I have to say that's probably the most notable thing about working at Google. Uh, I know a lot of the other companies in the Valley are trying to emulate what we do, and that's awesome. Uh, I genuinely believe in the fact that if you allow employees to be flexible in their work schedule, they will, in essence, become more productive in the end. Um, so, you know, there are many days where I'll work out during the day, regenerate my energy. Uh, maybe I'll take an early lunch or a late lunch. Um, but, you know, I, I really don't watch the clock. But, you know, looking back, there was one time in the past where I was looking at, hey, how many hours am I really working? And I found out that I'm, you know, I'm spending more time than, than I otherwise would. Uh, but it's not, I don't think of it as work. I think of it, hey, I have the energy. I want to work on this. I'm passionate about driving things forward. So, you know, maybe after the kids go to bed, I'll hop on the computer. Or you know, if, if an idea comes to mind over the weekend, you know, I, I might pop open the laptop and do some work. Um, but, you know, I don't view it as work. I think that's the key component is that if you really enjoy what you're doing, and I do, and I love working at Google, you don't think of those extra times outside of what's deemed normal business hours as work. You think of it as, you know, documenting a great idea or a passion. Um, so that flexibility um, is really, really key. The other part that makes uh, working at Google really interesting um, and I guess easier than working at a traditional corporate is that everything you need uh, is right here on campus. Food, I mean, we have gourmet breakfast, lunch, and even sometimes dinner. You know, the ability to uh, work out, we have, you know, endless pools, we have, um, you know, laundry can be taken care of for you, obviously at a cost, but everything you kind of need is right here. You don't have to leave the campus, hop in your car, drive down, you know, waste 30 minutes commuting to go get a sandwich and come back. You can kind of do everything right here and you could combine sort of team meetings and, and networking with lunch or coffee. And so everything that that's, that's one of, that's one of the brilliant things of, of the design of our, of our culture and our campus. What's uh, I'm trying to remember that phrase. It's like happy cows produce good milk. And I'm like, I just think that's, you know, probably a shift generationally of this model of like, you have to force people to work well and block Facebook from their computers versus the more contemporary, which is like, man, just make people happy and make them productive and everyone wins. That's exactly right. You know, if you, if you enable people to work and exert energy when they have the energy, you're going to get a much better output and you're going to get more out of people than forcing them to sit at their desk from nine to five, regardless of what, because your energy kind of goes like this throughout the day. And if you force people to, to try to work when they don't have that creative energy or, or that, that sort of emotional intelligence, then it's going to actually lead to a, a worse output. So, you know, really allowing people to manage that themselves and giving them the tools to do so is really the key. Mm. Well, one of the, the many reasons I was excited to connect is um, you have such an interesting story behind, you know, how you made it from the military into one of the most competitive companies in the world. And I know you've been sharing with a lot of people your story. So let's maybe back up to um, at, at what point did you know you were going to leave the military and, and how did you approach that? Well, you know, first, joining the military for me was something – you know, that I wanted to do since I was a child. Um, having grown up in North Jersey and having had an uncle that went to the Naval Academy class of 76, 
my sister had lived in Northern Virginia. I went to school there. We'd often spend weekends and holidays down in Northern Virginia, Annapolis. We'd you know, spend, uh, you know, we'd tour the campus and I'd always see the midshipmen walking around there in their white uniforms. And I was so, I was so like, I was so, you know, and, um, enthralled by the whole concept of, of serving my country and doing it in an exciting way. That it was sort of a foregone conclusion and inevitable that I was going to go there. Didn't know how I was going to get there, but I, I focused all my efforts to get there and I did. Um, but once I, you know, decided to go submarines, that that was an interesting decision in itself. Um, initially, I, I intended to be, be a Navy SEAL or, or uh, then an you know F-14 pilot. But once I figured out, hey, you know, like the path is not as certain. Um, there's no guarantee that you're going to be a jet pilot. Uh, I started to kind of shift my 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 uh, my sights on nuclear engineering and submarines, um, and that was a very uh, that was a sort of a a role that was in high demand. Um, and so, you know, it, it was an interesting experience. I, you know, but after, after a few years, you know, I got married and we were starting to have, uh, talk about having children, you know, it just occurred to me, I'm like, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to be away, um, that often. It wasn't really the right formula for, for me and my family. So, um, you know, having grown up in North and Central Jersey, everyone I knew growing up worked in finance and in New York City. So I always knew at some point in the future, I'd probably end up back in, in New Jersey or New York working in banking. I didn't know what the path would be or who I'd be working for, but I just kind of always knew I'd get back there. Um, and so, you know, there's no right, there's no one right answer to this. You know, for me, it was really about following my interests and my passions at the time. Um, and at that time, you know, getting back to closer to family, uh, working in banking was, was my interest. And so I followed it. Um, you know, and it, and it wasn't, it wasn't a big stretch really, you know, there's not a lot of difference between, you know, setting criticality uh, thresholds for a nuclear reactor, um, and comparing that to like, you know, figuring out value at risk for a portfolio of mortgage backed securities. You know, the subject matter is a little bit different, but they're both highly technical and, you know, coming from the Naval Academy. Yeah, I think you know, Justin, we're, we're basically imbued with the idea that we can accomplish or do anything, right? So uh, it wasn't that daunting of a, of, a, of a transition for me because I was like, okay, well, I can go be a brain surgeon, but that'll take me 12 years, or I can go right into derivatives, which happened to be really hot at that time. Um, obviously, hindsight tells us that <laughs> we were on a, a slow down spiral in 2006, but things were, were still pretty hot for about a year or two. So I made the transition. I'm happy I did. Um, what eased my transition, and we'll get into this later, is that, you know, I was hired by a former former Naval Academy grad. He was about eight, I'd say eight to nine years ahead of me. Um, he, he served in the Marine Corps. Uh, he went to Duke uh, for his MBA, and then he transitioned into banking. He utilized Lucas Group to find uh, people to fill roles in his team, and I happened to be one of those people. So he knew what I was capable of. I did, yeah. I went group path. Um, I, I can't tell you if that was the best path or the right path, but it seemed it felt right to me at the time, and it worked out really well. Um, so you know, this this his name is Aaron. He he groomed me. He knew I knew nothing about derivatives except well, I knew how to you know get to a derivative, but I didn't know what a deri financial derivative was, and that that he knew I'd, I'd learned that very quickly. So he hired me for my. My, my ability to bring order to chaos, my ability to manage people, my ability to learn quickly. And so he groomed me into the role um, very quickly. And from there, a lot of doors opened up for me. What was that, um, just in case that's, that's of interest to someone listening, like what, what did your work look like? What, what was your day-to-day -day life uh, like doing derivatives? Yeah, you know, surprisingly, it was very uh, operationally focused. Um, and that's where people like like us tend to do well. You know, we we there. You know, there's a mission, there's an objective. You have people to help you, and you go execute on it. And that and that's very much what uh, life in, in derivatives banking was like. Um, you know, every day you had to you know value a portfolio of securities so that you know your product team had accurate valuations to make business decisions. And, you know, you had sort of an inventory to know, hey, when I completed the valuation of all these securities, 
we're done, you know? Um, so that was like one part of the job. The other part of the job was thinking, constantly thinking about how do we make this better? How do we drive down the unit costs? How do we drive up productivity? Um, and so, you know, those are things that you, you also think about uh, as a junior officer at some point, right? Um, and, you know, and I have to say the most interesting part of that job was getting to manage a people, uh, a team of people who knew more than I did. That's always fun, right? Like you, you never want to be the smartest guy in the room, right? Because then you, your learning kind of stops. So if you're managing a team of people who know more than you do, then you're going to learn from them. Obviously, your job is to drive them and keep them motivated and utilize them in the best possible way. Um, but, you know, the, the job in banking, not a lot different than, than my job in the military. Mm. What, what led to that shift to uh, Deutsche Bank? Um, I was constantly looking for other opportunities to grow my, my team. Uh, where I was, the team wasn't uh, projected to grow. So for me, I wanted the next challenge. I wanted more scope. And the opportunity at Deutsche Bank presented itself. And what's funny is that the day after I started at Deutsche Bank, um, Lehman Brothers collapsed. And so it oh, was man. really You really were front row. <laughs> yeah. And I was walking up Wall, Wall Street that, that morning thinking, oh, man, what did I do? I should have stayed in my last job because who knows what's going to happen now. Um, but uh, it all worked out, and I was able to add a lot of value and bring – order to chaos, something that military people in general do very well. Um, and so, you know, things, things progress from there. At, at that point, were you thinking, um, well, actually, let me back up one, one other question for, for that initial career path, how essential was an MBA? Would you, would you recommend that to someone seeking to go into finance or what's your thoughts on that? MBA is interesting. I think there's two ways to think about an MBA. On the one hand, there's the sort of validation you've checked that box on your resume okay so if somebody doesn't know you and all they have to go off of is your resume it's important no doubt but if you know and if you have a really solid network and people in your network know what you're capable of then the, the MBA becomes less important in my in my experience um, so look MBA uh, at the time I, I was under the impression and I had the perception that it was it was very important to have um, but the reality is that, um, you know, the benefit of the MBA was more around the network for me. Yes, I learned certain tactics and, you know, got baseline understanding of accounting and, and other things. But um, to be honest, you, you mentioned my, my degree at uh, Old Dominion University, and that was in conjunction uh, with a nuclear power program. So some of the credits overlapped and I was able to get my uh, master's in engineering management. There's a lot of things I learned during that program two, two years prior that I actually still use today. Basic project management uh, skills, valuing a project, uh, net present value, IRR, those sorts of practical skills, I think, um, are very important. So, you know, it all depends on your specific circumstance. There's no right answer, but I would urge people to. Uh, you know, to explore like the top schools. I mean, those tend to kind of have a, a higher ROI in general. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you're really looking for a practical uh, experience or practical um, curriculum, then you know, there's a lot of other master's programs that, that, are, that are relevant as well. And, and then at this point, you're a vice president at Deutsche Bank, you know, very, very high up position at a very well-respected company. Are you thinking at this point, I'm, I'm taking this all the way, like I'm, I'm into finance, or at this point, what are you starting to think about where you want to go? Yeah, you know, prior to the financial collapse and, you know, my first day at Deutsche, I was thinking that way. I'm like, okay, I'm in finance, I'm on this ladder, I'm on this trajectory, I'm going to make director, I'm going to make managing director at some day in the future, it's just a matter of time. But then after the financial collapse, every, everything just kind of got mixed up and, you know, it was, it was a very difficult culture to work in when there was a sort of... Uh, you know, cloud of layoffs just looming over you every single day. And so um, it was very difficult to make personal life decisions when you have that cloud over your head. And so uh, over time, I started to, to kind of really question whether or not that was the right thing for me. Um, so I started, and no joke, I did a Google search, a Google search at that time. <laughs> What's, what's the best place to work for? Which companies have the best culture? And Google came up, right? unsurprisingly. <laughs> yeah. And 
you know, I very atypical, but I applied through that online portal where, you know, the people call it the black hole and you never hear anything again. But I was fortunate enough. I, I got a call back and, um, you know, things worked out, you know. So. No way. That is crazy, man. Um, I just, in my mind, I've always assumed that you have to get some, I mean, I assume this in general. And then for Google, I assume, you know, you have to like marry into some, to, to, to Google to get in. But the thought that you were able to go through the front door is incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, you know, somebody was looking out for me. I yeah. mean, the you know, probability of getting into the Naval Academy is pretty low. I think the probability of landing a job at Google through that path is even lower. Um, yeah, you know, and... It actually worked out because the type of work I was doing in Deutsche Bank, um, again, was very formative and set me up very nicely for the role that I applied for at Google. And that role I applied for here at Google was in finance operations. And funny enough, most of the people in finance operations at the time didn't come from finance. They came from McKinsey, other management consulting backgrounds. Um, a lot of them were in engineers, industrial engineers, uh, some operations people from GE, from Amazon. So it was really this really awesome mix of people with various different experiences. But none of them really had finance backgrounds, traditional finance backgrounds. Um, so I was one of the few that did. Um, and so, you know, that, that was a great sort of uh, bridge into the product side of things and technology. Even though it wasn't immediately on a product team, uh, I was still closer to a product. What, what, um, did, what did that day-to-day life, day -day life look like when you first joined? Yeah, you know, that day-to-day -day life, I have to say, was very, very similar to what, what I did in the military. And here's why. Here's the biggest parallel. In the military, you're a JO and you manage a team of specialists. Right. And those specialists are going really deep into their specific areas. Um, in this finance operations role, I was the manager of the team and I was managing a team of specialists. And these specialists, again, were going really deep into their role. And but, you know, the difference here is that they're located around the globe. And so instead of seeing them face to face and, you know, in mess hall or you know, squeezing by them through the missile compartment, you know, I'm getting on a GVC like, like we are right now. Right. <laughs> so, uh, or I'd make site visits. You know, I did a lot of travel to Krakow, Poland, a lot of travel to Manila. Uh, a lot of our folks were located in, in those, um, outsource centers around the world. Uh, but the other similarity was this half of my time, I was accountable and responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of a major payments process that was global. And any escalations that came up came to me. So, you know, if there's a, if there's a problem with the reactor plant and, you know, uh, there's a steam line rupture or drill, you, as the engineering officer of the watch, well, you got to take action, right? You're responsible. Same type of thing. If there was a missed payment or, you know, some, some fatal error that happened, I'm the guy in charge. I have to address it. And we have procedures for that. Um, but the other half of the job was thinking about, how to drive and improve efficiencies because when you're whenever you're dealing with large numbers of specialists and large numbers of volumes of units uh in this case you know these were payments in the military it's uh slightly different your your unit is probably you know steam flow uh it, it's it, there, there's a lot of room for improvement over time right especially when you're preparing for for big you know department of energy exams and you're trying to clean things up administratively but also process wise you know, we did the same thing on this team. We're always trying to drive process improvement, re-engineering things that no longer apply, um, automating things, uh, outsourcing things. So you're constantly evaluating as the business changes. Hmm. And so, so at this point, you've uprooted your family from New York. You go cross country to California. You're at Google. Uh, you're in this finance role. What what happens next? It was an investment. I have to say, you know, it was, um, parents and grandparents were not happy. I'll tell you, we just had our first child. She was six months old. It was the greatest thing that ever happened in our, in our world. And here we are moving cross country, uh, grandparents are like, Oh gosh, our first grandchild. Leave it. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it was, it was, it was bittersweet. They were very happy for us and that we had this awesome opportunity to go to California and work at Google. Um, 
But, you know, it, it was daunting. I'll be honest. Um, the first six to 12 months were very difficult. The transition was, you know, um, manifold, you know, both from living in a new area to, you know, working on a, on a different team with a different culture. Um, it, it was challenging. But, you know, in our mind, it was always like, here, we're here for two years. Let's reevaluate and then make a decision. Well, that was uh, nearly five and a half years ago. So we're still here and we're happy, uh, but we still think that way. We're like, okay, let's let's take this in bite-sized chunks. Every 18 to 24 months, let's evaluate where we are, um, knowing in the back of our mind, eventually we need to settle somewhere once our children get into like middle school and, and beyond. Um, but for now, let's continue to evaluate. Things are moving really fast. Uh, technology is just, you know, you know, it's, it's exponential growth. Who knows where we're going to be, you know, 12 to 24 months from now, what's going to be hot, what's not. Um, so we got to kind of stay flexible. And that's kind of the approach that we've been taking. And, you know, given how desirable of a workforce Google is, what advice do you have for a veteran who, who aspires to work there? Yeah. Okay. Well, the number one thing, well, so there's advice for people that are still in looking, planning to get out and there's people who've already gotten out. And so the advice is somewhat similar, but different. But I think what's most important is that network. Um, the network and people, you probably hear this all the time. It's not something that you just instantly uh, create. It's something that's created over time. You know, when I was growing up in North and Central Jersey, my network, my natural network, unbeknownst to me at the time, was family and friends who worked in finance. And, you know, they have they had the greatest respect for me, having served my country. And I would imagine that everyone out there has a similar type of engagement or network with their family friends. Um, those are the people that you rely on, you go to first for help and advice. Um, but your network needs to expand from there, right? You need to build out your professional network. You need to identify your advocates, your mentors, and your coaches. Um, and you need to, it's sort of like a garden, right? You need to give it light and water, right? And you need to keep it clean. And so it takes a lot of maintenance. Um, but I, I would say if there's something that can be done in parallel with anything and everything else you're doing, it's, it's really cultivating your network. Um, the other thing is thinking about, and, and just sort of like not rehearsing, but putting putting it on paper. How do you make what you've done in the military or currently doing relatable to to these roles in technology? Because as I just described to you, a lot of the stuff is similar. It's just a matter of terminology, right? You know, division officer is not a lot different than finance manager. Yeah. And. But the terminology becomes important because the reality is people, not everybody in technology understands how to translate those practical day-to-day -day activities that J.O. was doing. Uh, into, in, in, so it becomes a little scary and daunting for people, and naturally so. So, you know, there's people like myself and the Veterans Network at Google that, that do a lot of, you know, training of our recruiting team, a lot of internal um uh, messaging and, and coaching on what does it mean to translate this veteran's resume into this job here at Google. And we've been very successful in doing that. Um, but, you know, really practicing and finding somebody, you know, somebody like me that's already in that, you know, in your network, who's already in, in the corporate industry and having them kind of listen to you and give you feedback on how to relate and translate the work that you've done previously. I think that'll go a really, really long way. What about how, how difficult was it to, to shift from finance manager into your, your role in business development? Again, it sounds like a big shift, doesn't it? Um, and again, um, I, I approached it as, hey, uh, I've always been imbued to think I can do anything, right? And so um, a lot, some people just don't want to attempt that transition. But now that I've done it, it, it really... Um, wasn't as large of a, of, of a, of a, of a transition as, as you might expect. Um, and here's why, because I go back to what's, what's core to my day to day. I manage a team of experts who know more than I do and I have to deploy them effectively. That is so true regardless of what job you've done uh, in the past and what job you're likely going to do in the future. It's just a different subject matter that you're dealing with, right? So if you, you know, 
what, what's helped make me successful in the, in the skills that I've leveraged from the military and that I continue to leverage today is the mantra of to be early is to be on time. I, I, I genuinely believe that. Um, you know, bringing order to chaos, you know, in, 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 a, in I'm sort of in this team now that's a bit of a startup within a larger organization and we're growing so fast. And as you know, Justin, when you're in a startup, there's just so many things going on. It's very unpredictable and, you know, you're very lean and, you know, every it's all hands on deck, but that all, that often leads to chaos. And so, you know, if you can be that person that jumps in and can bring order to chaos, I mean, that, that goes a really long way, right? So that structure that you're accustomed to really helps. Now, there need, there's a time for structure and there's a time to be flexible. So it's not like we want structure all the time because that's not always the most effective way um, to get things done. So being able to read the room and understanding when that's necessary is super critical. Hmm. Um, I want to go into some que- like specific questions about kind of contrasting the military to civilian life. But but anything else? What what else would you like them to know about your your journey since the military? Yeah, you know, the biggest difference. I have to say that you know, if my journey's kind of been one through the elements. You know, I went from uranium to now silicon through derivatives. I'm sure there's some element uh, related to derivatives. I just haven't found it. But, <laughs> It's, you know, the military, the Navy is particularly, as you know, on a submarine, it's very tops down. I mean, there's a book on how to go to the bathroom, you know, like there's a procedure for everything. And it's very black and white uh, when it comes to casualty procedures. Um, So you're taking orders, you're executing on them. And not only are you executing on them, you're repeating back that you finished it. I mean, it's come on. It's pretty extreme. Uh, Banking. Similar, you know, uh, there, it's very hierarchical. Directors, managing directors, um, have a lot of power. They issue a lot of quote-unquote orders, and then you go execute on them. Obviously, it's not quite the same as the military, but it is tops down. This industry, and Google in particular, much more bottoms up. So if you go your whole career and you're used to tops down and all of a sudden you, you go into a bottoms up org and nobody tells you that it's predominantly bottoms up, you're going to struggle a little bit. And I did. Right. And so, you know, you might be waiting for somebody to tell you what to do or, uh, you know, you know, giving you orders or instructions. That's just not what happens here. You know, and, and I think in general in technology, the culture is such that you figure out the problem. You surface the problem, and then you persuade others um, that this is the problem worth investing in. And so it's it's more bottoms up. Obviously, as our companies continue to grow, there are a lot of tops down direction and initiatives. But marrying those with the bottoms up sort of um, issues that you're finding is really the key. And knowing that and being aware of that going into these types of roles is is really really helpful. Um, finding a coach who can kind of say, Hey, I know, I know what you're going through and, um, kind of staying, staying by your side over, over the course of a few months, kind of coaching you through those particular scenarios will really go a long way. Um, even communication is different. You know, it might sound silly. Yeah. I had an MBA. I was a submarine officer. Uh, I worked in banking, but I couldn't communicate in an email at Google. You know, so I got coaching. What's the right way to communicate? Tone, right? Tone is very important. What do you communicate in email? What do you communicate in person? What do you communicate through chat? Very, very important. So it's what you communicate and the channel through which you communicate. Very important. So those are sort of things that you learn on the job. Um, You know, and it's hard to kind of talk and teach it until you actually see it. But I think whoever's listening to this and they go through this one day, they're going to say, oh, okay, I know what he was talking about. (laughs) <laughs> what about um, you know having held leadership positions in the military and then in the world of finance and now at Google? How have you found that leadership differs outside of the military versus inside it? Yeah, you know that's an interesting question. Um, so in the military, there's a couple types of leaders. There's leaders that lead by by rank, and there's leaders that lead through inspiration. I actually think the true definition of a leader is one who leads through inspiration. Right. And everyone else is kind of a manager Uh, due to the nature of the type of work we we do. There's a strong emphasis on management and effective people management. 
Uh, leadership is something that's continuously being cultivated and, and worked on. Uh, it's a very important um, attribute here at Google. Uh, we have a lot of uh, focus and a lot of resources to help groom our, our managers into becoming more solid leaders. And, um, you know, I think of all the ways where my military background and the academy background has helped me succeed. I'm, I'm wondering the flip side, though, were there any habits you had to break coming from the military or things that you realized like this, this yeah. worked in the military, but it's not going to help me out now in my, my new career? It's a good question. Um, so there's this concept of being right and being effective. In the military, I guess, you know, it's, it's always important to be effective. Don't get me wrong. But there's right and wrong, right? Like your shoe is shined or it's not. You have an IP hanging from your button or you don't. You know, like, okay, yeah, you're right. Yes, sir, right? Um, but in corporate world, it's more, it's important to be effective, right? And so there's no real points for being right. You know, yeah, you might be right. The data shows that um, we're doing X, Y, and Z, but that might not be all of the data. And based on experience, that data combined with this sort of, you know, gut feel might be the effective way to go. And so like being able to navigate ambiguity, right? We try to eliminate ambiguity in the military. Ambiguity is just the nature of, of, of corporate America and in particular Google. And so navigating ambiguity, the gray zone um, is an art and it comes with practice and it comes by watching other people that do it well. I, I never put that together, but it is like, it's, it, it's true. Like it's kind of like a, or my experience with the military is it is kind of black or white and, and it is, it's incredible to build an organization of that size where you can distill things into kind of right or wrong, good or bad, but, you know, black and white and the amount of gray, it feels like, you know, especially in startups, but I think in every job, it's just, you live in that gray space and you live in that subtlety and it's, it's a lot more nuanced. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, what about with, um, you know, I know this is very anecdotal, but I'm just wondering at Google, you, you must see a lot of other veterans there and any thoughts on like, what are common entry points? Like, are there people, are, are most people going to business school and then Google, or are they going to another job or what sort of trends do you see from your fellow veterans at Google? I've seen a lot of different entry points, and that's and that's awesome. Uh, we have a very strong veterans network here at Google. A lot of participation. We do a lot of things for the community. Uh, we we host a lot of tech treks from organizations. We host we hosted a tech trek a couple of years ago of all former special forces folks. That was really cool. Uh, what it generally comes down to is cultural fit. Um, being flexible and open enough to understand the culture and try to adapt to it, right? And that that's and and you know it's not it's not 100% one way. You want to also share your experiences and 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 sort of craft that culture of the team you're working in. So, um, but being able to to again, it goes back to being relatable and translating your experience in a way that gets people excited and understanding of of what you've done and how you're going to add value is really the key to to getting it. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, so I always like to, to keep the last chunk, um, just to uh, turn it over to you. And, and just knowing that you have a group of veterans in active duty listening or watching this, um, what would you like to share with them? It could be personal, it could be professional, but just any advice or words you want to share with them? Yeah, you know, I, look, the grass is always greener uh, on the other side. You know, there's this perception that Getting out is, is going to lead to, you know, a better lifestyle or uh, more money. But that's not always the case. I have so many friends and so many family members that are still in the military today and are incredibly happy and satisfied, adding a lot of value. And in many ways, their financial future is more certain than, than folks who are not in. So don't, don't just assume that it's better um, – or infinitely better on the outside than it is on the inside. There are so many benefits to, to serving your country and, and doing it for a career that you really need to think about what it is that makes you happy and where your interests are. Um, and so keep that in mind. I mean, there, there was one point when at, in banking when, you know, after, after you know, the financial collapse, I was seriously considering 
trying to get back into submarines. I no joke, right? And um, this is after having been in banking and after getting my MBA. I was like, you know what? That life on a submarine, that certainty, the value that I'm adding, the reward that I feel is so powerful. It was drawing me back. So, you know, my advice is, yeah, you know, definitely pursue your interests. And if your interests are you know, leaving the military, pursue them, do your homework, practice being relatable, build that network. Um, but um, don't assume that that's always the right answer. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Stephen. I appreciate uh, not, not just the advice you're sharing, but also the example of someone who is um, going after things and, and making big shifts from finance to Google and, and serving as that role model for the community of what's possible. And uh, I also really appreciate the way that you make it accessible by, by all those parallels to the military. And, and I think you're being very humble because, um, you know, I agree that there's so many parallels where, you know, in essence, it's the same as the military. And I know that the, the, the fraction of people who are able to get into the type of position you're at right now at, at Google, it's so, it's so few people. And so I appreciate the humility on it, but I just want to recognize that you, you are working at one of the most difficult organizations in the world to get into. And it's, it's inspiring to see the example of someone who served their country and then and went on to continued greatness. So thank you for that. My pleasure. And, and, and honestly, anyone who's watching this at any point in the future, you ever want to reach out to me, Justin will, he'll, he'll share my contact information and happy to talk to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Stephen. Surface, surface, surface. Thanks for listening. Before you go, three important announcements. First, if you believe in what I'm doing and believe in supporting veterans in their careers, please, please, please help me spread the word. The best way I know to do that right now is by taking 18 seconds to write a review on iTunes. It would mean a lot. Second, based on my interviews, I'd advise any and all veterans to look at servicetoschool.org and the American Corporate Partners. Both are completely free for veterans and give you a lot of great resources for your education or professional life, respectively. Third, there are a ton of other great interviews, resources, and data at beyondtheuniform.io. Check it out, share it with your friends, and drop me a line if you have any feedback because I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, and see you on the next interview.